into the ice matrix, the H2O matrix, and disappears, and it's clear, and when you put it in a drink, it fizzes. The ice fizzes like Alka-Seltzer. It's really cool. Yeah, really amazing. Um, here's essentially another view of the same thing. This did not all happen at once. Like I said, bright idea. Let's pull together a little bit of money from the University of Wisconsin and with, from some private donors and send a team to <coughs> Greenland and see if they can melt a hole. And then we build a little one and then we build a bigger one. And now we've got half a billion dollars into this. And we actually have scientific results. When I was there in 2002, just for comparison, uh, we were working on the sort of the final trial phase, and that was called Amanda. At the time, and I'm going to show you a movie that talks about this. Um, there's a guy, and he's looking at a computer screen, and he pushes a button. He walks over to the printer. He gets a printout, and he walks over to a map of the sky. He goes, oh, yeah, right there. Uh, at the time, that process, we, we like to joke in this movie, that process from looking at the screen to printing it out to pointing to the sky, that's about a two-year walk uh, just to make that analysis. And now it's so much better. At the time, all we could do with Amanda was say, the neutrino came from somewhere over there. Is that a good telescope? No. Junk. And at this press conference in July, we now have it down to the neutrino, a bunch of neutrinos came from this galaxy three billion light years away. That's much smaller than a grain of sand held at arm's length. That's how good we've got at aiming this telescope. It's pretty good. Um, I think uh, this would be a good moment to... Uh, switch out of this and show this movie. Will the sound show up? Um, and the, the movie is a, a little bit low res. And I guess I would ask you to uh, also think about that in terms of See how this goes, okay. You have to, um, uh, you have to turn on the computer sound there. And let's see. No, not that one, that one. <coughs> Here we go. <coughs> so, um, I'll give you a little intro to this, and I'll, I'll full screen it as well. But um, a lot of people ask me, why? Why are they sending you to the South Pole? Um, and there was actually a, an evening we were sitting around in the lab at the South Pole, and I asked that to the scientist I was sitting next to. I said, why do you think they send a teacher to the South Pole? And he thought about it for a moment. He said, you know, until you got here and started asking questions, I didn't know what any of these other people right here in this room did on the project. Never thought to ask them. Uh, so I've, I've learned something. Another thing I like to say is I'll go shovel snow because it's funny because there's two miles of snow. So what chance do I have of winning? But in fact, there, we have a lot of maintenance issues at the South Pole. It doesn't snow a lot, but the wind picks up that snow dust and it covers everything, including scientific apparatus. There are bulldozers during the summer working constantly, moving all of that downwind of the station so things don't get buried. But there's places where you got to have actual humans get in there with a shovel and just dig stuff out. I will shovel some snow. I'm sure of it. Um, and another thing that uh, uh, I'll end up doing uh, is all kinds
kinds of stuff I couldn't have imagined. Uh, a week ago, I couldn't have imagined having this GoPro Fusion in hand and shooting 360 degree movies, but uh, uh, a guy at Purdue University asked if I would take the cameras and do that. And I, I like photography and do a lot of it. And yeah, I, I'm your guy, I'll do that. Um, this movie, uh, I was stuck at McMurdo, which is the big US base on the coast in 2002 with a, uh, two Ice Cube folks, a scientist from Belgium and a scientist from Germany. And we hung out and I taught them how to eat Thanksgiving dinner. Do you know how to do that? I'm not sure. He's going blank here. You probably do. I'm thinking. Anyway, I showed them how to do that. Um, and uh, we had this movie that was in German. And on my little old PowerBook G4, did you ever have one of those? Uh, PowerBook G4, an old, old Mac. I, uh, we, uh, now, you're, you're possibly too young. Um, possibly. Uh, and uh, so at McMurdo, we were just hanging out in our, in our gear, and we, we basically translated this into Russian and Spanish and Portuguese and French and found people that were, uh, uh, speak, could speak all those languages. And uh, so this is the English version of our little movie. Check it out. The universe is full of mysteries. Only small parts of its vast variety can be glimpsed with the human eye. Using ingenious modern detection systems, scientists can unveil new visions of the cosmos. For some time, there's been a new window into the universe that permits us to see space in a totally different light. Neutrino astronomy. In Antarctica, Physicists from around the world operate a new type of neutrino telescope, consisting of 670 light sensors melted into the deep ice of the South Pole. Its name? Amanda. Amanda is an array of devices for detecting muons and neutrinos. A constant rain of cosmic rays flows through the universe. Light, nuclei, neutrinos, and muons. Neutrinos are extremely small elementary particles that have an unusual feature. They rarely interact with ordinary matter. Light and nuclei are often swallowed by cosmic dust clouds, but neutrinos travel through space almost unaffected. Trillions of trillions of neutrinos reach the Earth every second. As messengers from their place of origin, they carry information from very distant galaxies, supernova explosions, and other energetic events and undiscovered objects. Neutrinos are unaffected as they penetrate the Earth, and they can travel right through the core of our planet. Are they completely unaffected? Well, not quite. A microscopic view shows how the travel of these ghost particles can sometimes be stopped by an extremely rare collision with the nucleus of an atom. Here is a neutrino colliding with the water molecule of the anionic ice. This collision breaks the nucleus apart, and the neutrino converts to a muon which is basically a heavy electron. From the side, you can see another view of the muon's birth. This particular muon was picked up by the detectors. Muons are able to travel several kilometers through the ice. You can recognize a muon that is traveling at nearly the speed of light by a cone of light that follows it. This cone is similar to a boat creating waves behind itself. Looking inside the light cone, you can see its structure. This light is known as Cherenkov radiation. The muon emits very faint blue light rays out in the front side. Taken together, all these emitted rays form a hollow cone behind the muon. In the darkness of the Antarctic ice, this glow can be detected up to 100 meters away. The Amanda detector 
frozen in a depth of 1,500 to 2,000 meters. It's optimized in order to see this light. Amanda is built out of powerful light sensors which are packed into pressure-resistant glass spheres. Several hundred of these, attached to steel cables, have been placed more than a mile deep into the ice of the South Pole, where they watch for the faint signals from fast-moving particles. When the muon flies to the Amanda detector, each light sensor registers the passing colored light within one billionth of a second. The sensors convert the light into electrical signals which travel to computers at the ice surface. Scientists at the South Pole Amanda Center supervise the data recording and do initial analysis. Complex computer programs investigate the chronological order and intensity of the signals. From this information, scientists can calculate the most important information for any telescope, which direction the initial neutrino came from. Several hundred neutrino reactions have been detected in trial phases. In January 2000, scientists and engineers were able to finish the second phase of Amanda's expansion. There are now 670 light sensors in the ice, and in a few years, a much larger telescope with 5,000 light sensors will be built. This will be known as Ice Cube, as the finished detector will be a cube a kilometer on every side the largest scientific instrument ever constructed. What will these tiny neutrino messengers reveal? Huge energy jets that generate cosmic radiation? The origin of the dark matter? The birth of a supernova? Or something totally different? Every time that humans have built a new way to see into the heavens, they have been surprised. Nature has a great imagination. What surprises will the cosmos reveal through Amanda and Ice Cube? So, a uh, couple things to kind of sum that up. It's called Ice Cube because we've got a cubic kilometer of instrumented ice. That is the largest scientific instrument humans have ever made in deep ice at the South Pole. Uh, we say there at the end, every time humans have constructed a new way to see into the heavens, they have been surprised. And that is absolutely true. Uh, Galileo was surprised. What did he see when he pointed a telescope up to the sky? Anybody know any of this story? 400 years ago? Oh, oh, what did he see? Oh, was it Saturn? Ah. Or did he was a comet? Not exactly. He did observe Saturn. He could not figure out what he was looking at. In fact, he thought the planet had ears because there was nobody, nobody had any idea that there, you, there could be a thing like a ring structure. So uh, he never figured that out, and his telescope was not good enough to do that. That came, what, 150 years later, give or take. Um, he looked at Jupiter. What did he see there? Did anybody know that story? Yeah? Ah, and what were they doing? Oh, they were orbiting around Jupiter. But everything should be orbiting around the Earth, because it's where the most important things are. Um, yeah, that was a surprise. He also saw uh, Venus had phases. He saw craters on the moon. It seems amazing that he would have to uh, even point out, you know, the moon has craters. It, we kind of look at it now and go, yeah, okay, I can almost see them with my naked eye, but there was a time. Um, after World War II, British scientists, uh, they got a hold of some surplus radar gear that had been developed in World War II because it, it had gotten so much better that you could get the old stuff for free. And they pointed it up at the sky. They were looking, uh, hoping to find tracks uh, when a meteor goes through the sky, it ionizes the air, it makes it reflective, and you can actually pick up a radio signal, let's say if you're in London, from Paris, reflected off that for a few seconds. Whoa. Tracks and meteors. And they found, oh, the sun is giving off radio. Jupiter is giving off radio. All kinds of things are giving off radio. Nobody had any idea that radio astronomy could be a thing. It 
It's a thing. The, now we can detect gravity waves. Now we can detect neutrinos. We are into multi-messenger astronomy, and we're, we're going to find out amazing things. Did you ever wonder what it would be like to live at a time when humans were discovering an incredible amount about the world? Like, oh, if I could only live in the age of discovery back when uh, Columbus and Magellan were able to come to the New World and take people's stuff. Um, uh, no, you live right now, you live in an age of discovery. And, you know, it's very easy to think, oh, nobody appreciates science anymore. But in fact, we're doing amazing, amazing things. Um, the Ice Cube Neutrino Telescope, I think it's a really interesting detail, it actually looks down. It looks for neutrinos coming up through the Earth. The signal's going that way. Isn't that weird? In fact, if I can click back to it, I'll show you the logo for the Amanda telescope that just went by a moment ago. Yeah, uh, it's a little hard to see in this resolution, but you've got the penguin and the little penguin uh, baby dude, and they're actually looking down. This globe would be upside down from its normal orientation. Only neutrinos are going to make it through the Earth and get into the detector that way. But neutrinos are very hard to catch. What size net do you need if you are going to need to catch a certain number of fish? And the fish are extremely slippery and hard to catch. What size detector do you need? You need to catch some fish. The fish are slippery. They're hard to catch. What's the size of your net? You need to take these guys fishing, I think. You need a big net if you want to catch some slippery fish. Um, a really big net. I mean, yeah, okay, the holes, the holes in the net have to be small, but the net has to be really big. Are we making this even bigger now? Of course we are. Are scientists ever satisfied? Okay, we're done here. We got no more questions. No. no. In fact, this I was laughing because uh, you borrowed this over the weekend and it says a century-old mystery solved at the South Pole. There's no solving anything. There's just answering one question and getting six more. Right. Um, so um, I'm headed to the South Pole on the 23rd of November. Um, I'll fly to New Zealand, and New Zealand I will pick up a whole bunch of cold weather gear, um, and then I will fly from there to McMurdo on the coast. There are about 5,000 people at McMurdo. I've heard it described as a cross between a college town and a mining town. Yup, people have bands, there are bars, people work hard, they play hard. From there, I will fly to the South Pole. And I'll be there about two, two to three weeks, give or take. Um, I will send you, I've got a page with all kinds of links about this project. It is possible, if the timing's right, uh, that the next time we talk, uh, I could be calling in to the class here. And you could see my face from the South Pole right there on the screen. And wouldn't that be exciting? And you could ask questions like, is it cold? And I would say, yes, it's cold. And yeah, and then we could get into more, more interesting things. Um, That's kind of what I'm going to do. Um, <clears throat> I'll tell you about a couple other things that I'm going to be involved with um, that I'm kind of excited about. One, has anybody ever messed around with an Arduino or coding of any kind, a little bit of robotics? Yeah. So I am a musician as well, and um, since I started playing in a Hawaiian band uh, a number of years ago, uh, I started taking my ukulele everywhere I go. So I was going to take a ukulele to the South Pole, and one thing led to another, and one of my former students, Jay, just like you guys, except uh, that was 12, 10, 10 years ago, I guess, um, he's now teaching physics at the University of Washington, and as soon as he heard I was going to the South Pole, he, he was like, uh, can I come along? Well, no, but let's, let's get together and have a, have a beer. Um, and one thing led to another, and what we decided to do was make a 
ukulele in a case <coughs> that will uh, collect environmental information, temperature, light, radiation, and it will respond to that by playing songs using servo motors and frets. Yeah, what an insane idea. Some of that could sound not